Hey, everybody, it's John from The Hustle Daily Show. Before we get into the news today, did you know that HubSpot launched an AI chatbot that helps you build awesome campaigns at scale with just a few prompts? It's called Campaign Assistant, and it's a totally free to use AI tool that will transform the way that you build marketing campaigns at scale. And the best part, it works seamlessly with all of HubSpot's marketing and sales tools to scale your output across email, social, and more. So AI your way into the most effective campaigns yet at HubSpot.com slash campaign dash assistant. What's going on, everyone? It's Wednesday, March 15th. I'm Zachary Crockett here with Rob Litterst, and you are listening to The Hustle Daily Show. Today, we're talking Meta. Mark Zuckerberg has said that he's entering a year of efficiency. Meta has a second round of layoffs coming, so he's going to be living up to that promise, unfortunately. We're going to talk through what that means for Meta and the broader tech industry. But first, let's take a look at what else is going on in the world of business and tech. Microsoft is making 3D avatars that animate you based on your voice. No camera needed. Those are going to be widely available on Teams in May, and they're probably perfect for those times you just don't feel like being on camera in a meeting. Some good news in the drug market. The Danish pharma company Novo Nordisk has said that it plans to cut U.S. list prices on several insulin drugs by up to 75%. That's following a similar move by Eli Lilly & Co. a couple weeks ago. The consumer price index cooled slightly in February, up 6% year over year. That's the smallest rate of growth since September 2021. And just a reminder, the consumer price index is a pretty decent gauge of inflation. So the Fed likes to see that. A report from the cybercrime analytics provider SpyCloud revealed that hackers leaked 721 million passwords last year. Those were mostly exposed through third-party platforms due to malware. And the worst thing from that report is that 72% of those hacked users went on to use the same exact password. They didn't even bother changing it. <laughs> Sounds about right. So, uh, yeah, we're likely to see history repeat itself next year on that one. The DOJ is suing Rite Aid. They're accusing the pharmacy chain of knowingly filing unlawful prescriptions for opioids and other controlled substances while ignoring red flags eBay has its first union. Workers of TCG Player, that's a trading card seller that eBay bought for about $300 million back in November, they have voted to unionize. So we'll keep an eye on that. And lastly, Dubai dropped its 30% alcohol tax to court more tourists and expats. Last year alone, tourists in Dubai spent $29 billion. So wow. I don't think they're hurting for more tourists, but uh, dropping the alcohol tax is probably going to help boost that a little more. I'm excited to see that math. It's like if you <laughs> lower that alcohol tax, do people drink more and then end up buying enough stuff that it makes up the difference anyway? Yeah. Well, as we wrote in the hustle once, uh, people like to go shopping when they're drunk. So a hundred percent. We'll see. We'll see. Guilty. <laughs> yeah. All right, Rob, let's talk meta here. So tech is obviously off to a very rough start this year. But in the face of that hardship, it seems like a lot of the major players, including Meta, have sort of adopted this new attitude about staff cuts. And it seems like they're taking a page out of the startup playbook a little bit. Totally. I think it's really interesting. One of the biggest predictions back when Elon Musk was taking over Twitter and started to lay people off was that other companies would start doing the same thing if mm -hmm. it seemed to work out for Twitter, right? Like I saw a bunch of kind of Twitter think boys posting about this, and <laughs> investors posting about this, right. I'm like watch out for the cuts that are going to come if Twitter stays functional. And I mean, I think you can say a lot of things about Musk's reign at Twitter, but the site is still up. It's still running. It's still going. So I think some people look at that and they say, you know, if it can stay up and running with the cuts that they've done, yeah. then we probably have room to cut back a little bit ourselves. Yeah, like on the one hand, you know, that attitude among other tech CEOs, it's sort of admirable. It's like, look, we're going through a tough time, but we can cut back and make do with less. We can still make this work. It's sort of taking the best of a situation. But then on the other side, you know, the critics are like, you know, what the fuck? Like, um, <laughs> you're basically devalidating the fact that a company takes a lot of talented people to run. There's sort of like a hubris involved with thinking you can run your company just as well with a skeleton crew. Right, right. And it's 
really interesting. I remember seeing these things back in the day that would be like, one developer can be worth 25 developers. And it's like, you think about that kind of across the board, there's kind of a similar thing in sales where, you know, you can really see outsized performance and you can see when people are really top performers. Yeah. But I feel like not all disciplines and functions are that transparent. Mm. And I don't think it's really that easy to see that somebody's performance is that much better than somebody else's in all functions. I mean, Elon Musk is, I think, kind of solve that by just cutting entire functions. Like I'm pretty sure he got rid of Twitter's entire PR right. department, which, you know, I think probably had hundreds, if not thousands of people. Right. Yeah. It's that whole hardcore mentality, which right. as you can see, not everybody is bought into. And even the people that I think did originally buy into it at Twitter are probably now questioning themselves a little bit. Yeah. That's a great point. It's really easy to quantify Jim and sales impact on the team. You can see that he brought in, you know, $2 million in new clients or something. Not so easy to quantify the value of, you know, an HR person or someone who runs your blog and is in SEO traffic. Like, how does that translate to the bottom line? Totally. And I think like, it's not surprising to me that Mark Zuckerberg is adopting this strategy and kind of adopting this mindset. Because when you rewind back to the beginning of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg is an engineer, right? He was an Mm -hmm. IC. He's a highly productive engineer. He's one of those guys that if he didn't start Facebook, he would be worth whatever, 25, 50, 100 times the next engineer, right? Right. Because he's clearly very capable and very driven and talented. So turning to Meta and Mark Zuckerberg, you know, Meta cut 11,000 jobs or something like that last year. That's right. At the end of last year. What's the latest news here? What's Zuck doing today? Yeah. So it sounds like Meta is set to cut an additional 10,000 jobs. So almost matching what they did a couple months ago and also withdrawing 5,000 open roles. So that's about a 25% workforce reduction year over year. Zuck has been quoted saying flatter is faster. So kind Mm. of getting rid of some of these roles, promoting a flatter organization with less levels of bureaucracy, which again, kind of ties back to, I think that kind of developer ethos and it, it makes sense. It doesn't really surprise me, but it is interesting. I mean, I think there are a lot of companies in tech that are going through layoffs. Pretty much nobody has been immune from this. Meta is a, a rare case though. Like I think Meta is one of those companies that really overhired and was hiring like crazy over the last couple of years to an extent that other companies weren't really matching. Hmm. I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see what the fallout is from what Meta's doing and like how relevant that strategy becomes for other companies. Because sure. I, I do think in some ways Meta at the scale that it is and at the scale that they were hiring is really kind of a rare case. Sure. Yeah, Zuck posted a a very long post on Twitter about this on his Facebook page and sort of spelling out how these cuts are going to affect the company. And it seems like a big area where these cuts are going to affect the company is in the recruiting side of the business. So Mm. they're really going to cut back on in-house and third-party recruiters. And as you said, sort of withdrawal 5,000 open job roles, which is a staggering number of job listings. Yeah. They're really looking to, to sort of pair down on the expansion front. Totally. Which is interesting because, you know, Meta and many other of these big tech companies really, I mean, they really, really overzealously expanded in 2020 and 2021, it seems. Totally. Yeah. And it's so unfortunate, you know, in a downturn, it does seem like HR has been one of those functions that has been impacted by this. When you're letting people go and you're not hiring, I think the first place that a lot of these companies are looking to see if they can trim headcount is usually HR. Mm -hmm. So super unfortunate, but I guess in the context of what's going on, it makes sense. Yeah. And more broadly, this isn't a meta problem. If you look at layoffs.fyi, which is a company that tracks layoffs in the tech industry, 128,000 layoffs. That's crazy. So far in the first quarter of 2023. And we're not even through the first quarter yet. Yeah. Those numbers are bad, Zach. I think if Silicon Valley Bank hadn't gotten bailed out, I think they could be even worse. So I think we maybe even avoided what could have been an even worse situation. So Zach, the scariest part about this is Wall Street's reaction. So as we're recording this, Meta stock is up over 7%. The company's projected revenue per employee shot up. Other big tech investors' ears no doubt did the same. It seems like this could be a playbook that other companies might follow. It seems like it could really kind of transform the way the new startups are hiring and being built. And I could definitely see a trend towards 
leaner organizations, more durable growth, Mm. slower growth, more thoughtful growth, and less of the rapid hiring that we have seen over the last few years. Sure. I just want to say to to contextualize these layoffs a little bit, there has been a lot of criticism about these efforts to scale back staff. And I think a lot of it is valid criticism. You know, these companies have spent an insane amount of money on stock buybacks. Over the last decade, Meta has spent close to $120 billion on stock buybacks. You know, between July 2021 and 2022, Meta bought $48 billion worth of its own shares. Wow. And it got a terrible deal on those shares. It bought them at $303 a share. Goodness. As of now, Meta stock is $194 a share. So they're they're taking big loss on those stock buybacks. But also just if you have the capital to spend the hundred plus billion dollars on stock buybacks over a decade, I think a lot of people would say there's an argument there to reinvest in your staff and growth and totally reallocate some of those funds to retaining talented members of your staff and you know, weathering through a crisis like this. I mean, extra capital can be used to weather crises. I mean, traditionally, that's how businesses use it. Hiring decisions all start at the top, right? So like these layoffs, I think, are indicative of a strategy that didn't pan out. And that starts with leadership, right? That starts Mm -hmm. at the top. And it's nothing that the employees did. I think, to your point, there are a lot of different things that you can do with your money. You can release, you know, press releases, blog posts, whatever you want to do. But there's always alternatives that you can take. And I mean, unfortunately, a lot of companies are kind of going layoff route. But to your point, Meta specifically definitely could have done other things, I think, sure, to address the situation. Yeah. So I guess the last question here is tech workers have had a leg up for a while now. I mean, for the last decade, tech workers have commanded enormous salaries, great benefit packages. You know, companies have put on bidding wars for the top performers, not even executive level employees, just like a good coder, you know? Right. How is this sort of poised to change the competitive market for the tech industry, you think? Well, it's interesting. It feels like companies are starting to have kind of a take it or leave it approach. It's putting some of the power back in the hirer's hands. Yeah. If you remember like a year, two years ago, it seemed like all the power was in the applicant or the job seeker's hands, right? Yeah. People were just hiring in abundance and people were offering perks like crazy. And it does seem like things are kind of going back towards the company having the upper hand. I don't know. It's It seems like just broadly, like the economy, the stock market, these kinds of trends, they always veer towards the extremes. And I feel like mm-hmm. we're kind of hitting an extreme now on the other side of things because companies aren't hiring and have paused hiring to such an extent that we're starting to see this take it or leave it approach. I'd be really surprised if we don't settle in the middle somewhere in the next couple of years. Sure. But I mean, I think like one of the biggest things, and we've talked about this a bunch on the podcast, is like some of the perks that companies offered just don't really matter, like a ping pong (laughs) table and beer fridge. I mean, I do think there's an argument for more office involvement. I work remotely. I love working remotely. I think there are some jobs that it makes a lot more sense for people to be in the office. Yep. And that's an interesting development here too. I know Meta has instituted new cubicles in some of their offices. So it sounds like they're kind of trying to time travel back in time to to an earlier time, maybe a simpler time um, to kind of avoid the mistakes of the last couple of years. Yeah. I mean, and you know, the things like ping pong tables, juice bars, whatever, those were put in place to attract talent. I don't think talent really wants that stuff anymore. I mean, if you have like Rob Litters does not want to stay after work and play ping pong. He wants to go home and spend time with his son, you know? Right, right. So yeah, I just think, as you said, (laughs) workers' priorities have adjusted a little bit in the work from home era. And I think those are sort of frivolous expenses that they can start with. Totally. All right, folks, that's going to do it for us today. Thanks for tuning into the Hustle Daily Show. We're a proud part of the HubSpot Podcast Network. Our editor today was Robert Hartwig, and our executive producer is Darren Clark. We've got a lot more tech and business coverage for you in our newsletter. If you're not subscribed, go find it over at thehustle.co slash email. And until then, we'll catch you tomorrow. Hey, guys. If you listen to the Hustle Daily Show on Google Podcasts, 
We want to let you know that the option will no longer be available pretty soon. Google is sunsetting its podcast app sometime in early 2024 in favor of YouTube Music, and we want to give you a heads up before it's too late since that time's almost here. The Hustle Daily Show is available everywhere and anywhere that you listen to podcasts like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. If you're using YouTube Music, we are there as well. If you're an Android fan, there are plenty of apps like Overcast, Pocket Casts, Player FM, and more. So just search for us wherever you decide to listen to your favorite podcasts.